Hi, my name is Randy Picker, and I'm a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. It's Thanksgiving week uh, in the United States, uh, so I'm here in Chicago. Um, I, I was asked if I could appear virtually in Brussels. Uh, I like Brussels, so I wish I could be there physically. But I hope you have a great conference, uh, and thanks for letting me uh, spend 10 minutes with you this way. So I want to talk Google. Um, that seems the thing to do. And I've got three quick thoughts that I want to try to get out uh, for you. So one of these is, is about sort of the entry path for dominant firms. Um, uh, we seem to be creating barriers within antitrust. Uh, I think many of those barriers sound like sort of what I'll call a junior varsity intellectual property regime. Um, and I'm not sure we've thought that through fully. That's issue one. Issue two is, I'm going to talk about the Google Shopping case. Uh, it's obviously framed as a tying case. I think it's got a common carrier feel to it. Uh, um, and uh, we don't do very much of that in antitrust, certainly not in the United States. We sort of leave that to other law. So I want to talk through that a little bit. And then I want to talk about Android. Um, I, I think the business model competition there in the smartphone operating system space is interesting. Uh, and I want to put out the idea of, I, I think the... EC is demanding what I'll call a dominance pivot, uh, and I think that's a very demanding standard. So those are the three ideas I want to get out. So I'll go back to something near the beginning. Um, we're in 2012. Uh, we're at this point just sort of talking about what's going on. Um, and the concern here is, is vertical search, that Google's got a dominant position in horizontal search, 90% uh, market share in many countries in Europe. Um, it's now entering other markets. Um, and the concern is, is that the way it's entering those markets, first of all, prefers its own products. Uh, and that the way it's doing it involves, in some sense, using the content or ideas of others, uh, framed as scraping. Um, and that there will be consequences associated with that, consequences with regard to diminishing the incentive to enter markets in the first place. I, I think that sounds like an intellectual property regime. The whole point of many IP regimes, patents and copyrights, is to construct regimes where we have very precise ways in which we say here are forbidden uses and here are permitted uses by firms. All of that's about trying to get, to get inventions in the one case, uh, expressions, copyrighted works in the other, created and making sure that we have sufficient incentives for creation while also in some sense maximizing use after the fact. That's a standard IP trade-off. I don't think we're making that trade-off here. I think there is a perspective that somehow in situations where Google is said to borrow ideas, it's doing so in a way that if it violates applicable IP law, be that patent law or copyright law, Go, great, block them from doing that. That's precisely the, the domain of those bodies of law. But in situations where those bodies of law are not being violated, then the question is, why should we somehow be creating a separate, what I'll call junior varsity regime in antitrust? A regime which almost by definition can't be as thoughtful and nuanced as developed uh, as, as the actual IP regimes. We've done a little of that in the United States with regard to copyright misuse doctrine. I'm not sure that's been very successful. Idea two. So idea two is, is in connection with the Google Shopping case. Um, so the, the, the concern over vertical search in some sense morphs into, vertical, uh, into the shopping situation, um, a substantial fine, and again, this concern that Google is preferring its own products. Well, when, when the press release came out, I did what a modern academic does is I went to Twitter. Uh, and this is the picture I put up on Twitter. Um, and part of what I wanted to describe is, is I don't think certainly in U.S. antitrust law, and I don't think really in EC competition law, that law says much about the relative size of these three boxes, the organic results and then the ads. The United States is very clear that a successful firm that achieves a, a substantial position in the marketplace, a monopolist as it were, one that acquires that position legitimately, is allowed to charge high prices. And having lots of ads is the equivalent of charging high prices here. So I don't think US law 
says anything really about the size of these boxes, and I'm a little skeptical what I know about EC law, that it really says much about that either. Well, if that's right then, what is the complaint and what's the angle? And the angle that emerges here, and now we've gone from the press release uh, to the eventual Google Shopping decision, is the idea that Google should be engaging in some sort of kind of neutrality between its own new products and the new products of other firms. I hear the comparison shopping service. Boy, I think that's a demanding standard. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't know as you think through how that applies in situation after situation, whether it's actually worth the cost of doing that, given the likely gains, which I think are small, that will emerge from this. What do I mean by that? Each time a dominant platform rolls out a new feature, it seems to have an obligation to become a kind of quasi-common carrier with regard to its competitors. Build something which makes it possible for them to operate at the same level of access that the, that the, that the dominant platform does without having any clue whether or not any of these products are going to go anywhere. So when you think about the full range of possible products, most of them are a bust. And Google, like every other firm, has had its share of busts. See its position with regard to Google Buzz and then Google Plus. So it's not as if these new features always go anywhere. It seems to me we're going to impose a heavy tax slash burden on new features, especially for dominant firms, if we're saying to them that not only do they have to come up with these features and figure out a way to build them that works, but also to act as a common carrier simultaneously at the same time. Uh, that seems to me to be a kind of design neutrality or feature neutrality that, again, I don't think is within certainly U.S. antitrust law, and I'm skeptical that it makes sense within European competition law as well. Third idea. So um, now we've come to Android. Um, we've obviously at this point only have the press release. Um, uh, I do what I'm told to do. I keep going to the website, uh, uh, and I'm still... Uh, living with the press release, maybe a month away. That would be a nice Christmas present. Uh, I'm a simple guy. Um, I want to talk about, uh, as this decision came out, or at least as the press release came out, I wrote a blog post on it uh, for the Stigler Center blog uh, at uh, the Booth School of Business. You can go get that. What I wanted to give a sense there was, was a little bit of the history of competition in the smartphone operating system space. So the short version of that is, is Nokia and BlackBerry were in some sense dominant with the kind of positions that when you say, oh, network externalities, how is that position going to go away? And we know what happens, of course, which is the very interface of these devices changes with the iPhone. And at that point, then, we had a very interesting business model competition taking place, where Apple was being Apple, a vertically integrated hardware software solution. Microsoft was being Microsoft. They wanted to try to sell operating system software. And Google was in some sense being Google, a two-sided market play. Here, take the Android software. Here, here is Google Play. But it comes with our other software. And that other software was effectively an advertising component uh, and extending Google Search, which would effectively finance that software three very different business models with regard to operating system software, let the competition take place. And what that competition showed us was that the Microsoft model was not effective here, uh, that Apple has been extremely successful in that market, even with a 20% market share. And Android's obviously 80% in the world. The public has spoken. That's what they wanted. That's what they got. That was attractive. That's where the dominance comes from. And now what the commission seems to be demanding that Google do is that at the point it achieves dominance, that it pivot, that it abandon the business model that took it to there, and that it all of a sudden figure out that it's achieved dominance, that the European Union will believe that they've achieved dominance, um, and to figure out exactly, sort of guessing, as to what the alternative business model is that will solve the problem of the kind of tying that they would otherwise be seen as engaging on once they've achieved dominance. Again, the public spoke here. The public didn't want software to be sold on a freestanding basis for a fee. That's what Microsoft tried, and it was rejected by the public. But that's exactly what the EC seems to be requiring Google to do. Requiring is a strong word, but I think fair in the sense that everyone should expect 
that Google would, once the business model it had developed was broken, switch to a different business model that would require charging for the Android software. That, of course, is exactly what they've announced so far. I'm not sure exactly what we're accomplishing there. Three quick slots, 10 minutes. Um, I hope the rest of the conference is great. Um, uh, thanks for letting me do this. Again, I'm Randy Picker at the University of Chicago Law School.